of uh, your, the beginning of your lecture. Uh, so without further ado, please, uh, I would like to allow Professor Herstel Raff to start uh, his lecture. And you may start whenever you're ready. The session is yours. Thank you. Great. Um, I think there's my picture, but I'm sharing my screen. There we go. Outstanding. So first of all, I can't tell you how thrilled and honored I am to be invited to this very exciting session. I have to say that I'm incredibly impressed and I'm already thinking about how to use your format in my institution. So uh, it incredibly uh, interesting approach to medical education, which I find really impressive and very honored. It is amazing. I'm sitting in my little office here in Milwaukee, almost exactly the opposite end of the world, speaking to you as if we were in the same room. I'm still blown away by that. So without further ado, how do we define a gland? Well, there's two kinds of glands. There are exocrine glands, and when you have your sessions on GI physiology, if you haven't already, you will learn that most GI glands have a duct. So the pancreatic duct, for example, that goes from the pancreas to the small intestine, but also your sweat glands, mammary glands, salivary glands, all secrete something that goes through a duct into a lumen. That's, that's basically the inside. The stomach is another great example. Endocrine glands also make secretory products, but the classic definition is they go directly into the blood. So there's a whole lot of endocrine glands and there's no way I could do all of them justice in this uh, 50 minute session. So I decided today to focus on neuroendocrinology which is basically the hypothalamus, the pituitary, and target gland. You will undoubtedly hear all about diabetes and bone disease and reproduction in other sessions. I am going to focus on the hypothalamus, the pituitary, the adrenal cortex, the liver, and the thyroid gland. Not in that order, but that's the order they are in this slide. So what are the different types of input to increase or decrease the secretion of a hormone? Because after all, the definition of physiology is homeostasis. And the definition of homeostasis, as you learned from Dr. Silverthorne, a close friend and phenomenal teacher, is to keep things as steady as possible when you're faced with an environmental stressor. So, Endocrine cells can respond to ions or nutrients like glucose with respect to the beta cell of the pancreas, neurotransmitters, and we're going to focus mostly on hormones stimulating other hormones. So Dr. Silverthorne already talked to you about the glucose control system because she shared her slides with me. And I'm going to point out to you how important endocrinology is. The students, my students joke about this. That's all I ever talk about. But I'm going to point out Nobel Prizes as we go. Not that that's the end all and be all of importance, but I think they've got it right most of the time. So how, how do you control your blood sugar when you eat a candy bar or some, a tea with a lot of sugar in it? Well, your gut absorbs the sugar. It goes into the blood, but sugar is bad for you. Sugar is toxic. So the body has developed many ways of disposing of that glucose, one of which is stimulating insulin secretion from the endocrine pancreas. Insulin then increases glucose uptake into muscle, and that, by a negative feedback, restores plasma glucose. So the best way to think of homeostasis is if something's too high, your body wants to lower it. If something's too low, your body wants to raise it, just like the temperature of the room you're sitting in. It probably has a thermostat that's hooked either to an air conditioner or a furnace. If it's too cold, the furnace comes on. If it's too hot, the air conditioner comes on. And so this negative feedback loop is the critical part of all homeostatic processes, whether it's the temperature in your room um, or the amount of glucose in your blood. And there were two Nobel Prizes given for this. One was Banting and Best in the Cloud, who, of course, 
got it for the discovery of insulin. And the other was the great Rosalind Yellow, who developed the radioimmunoassay, the first way, the first way to measure insulin in the blood. Two Nobel Prizes, one slide. That's pretty impressive. So here's two more Nobel Prizes. And this is the definition of neuroendocrinology. This, of course, is the brain in, cut in half. And we're not going to go through neuroanatomy right now, but this little tiny part down here, actually, let me change this to a laser so it's a little bit more visible. Good. Is the hypothalamus, which means below the thalamus. Hypo means below. It's a little tiny part of the brain. If you want to know where your hypothalamus is, it's right above the roof of your mouth. And below that hangs the pituitary gland and it hangs on this little stalk. So now let's look at this blown up. Here's the hypothalamus. And this cartoon shows the concept of different short nerves that terminate on a blood vessel in the hypothalamus, the median eminence, which is part of the hypothalamus. So the hormone number one is this neurohormone that's released into the blood of these very small special blood vessels called portal vessels. And the definition of a portal vein is a capillary vein capillary. And in GI, you'll learn about the portal vein that connects the small intestine when you absorb food to the liver. That's called the portal vein. This is another portal vein. And if you've ever been to San Francisco where I train, you know there's a neighborhood called the Portal because it's a neighborhood connected by a tunnel that ends in another neighborhood. That's how the name portal came about. So when these neurohormones are released into the blood, they go into the anterior pituitary and stimulate a different cell type to release the anterior pituitary hormone into the blood. We're gonna come back to these long green neurons in a little while that terminate in the posterior pituitary. So the purple nerves are the short axons that terminate on these blood vessels, go through the portal to the anterior pituitary and either stimulate or inhibit the release of the pituitary hormone. So a Nobel Prize was given for this. In fact, two Nobel Prizes were given because one was given for vasopressin, which is the green nerves, and one was given for TRH and GNRH, which is the purple nerves. So here we've already had four Nobel Prizes in three slides. So how does this all work? Well, we have the hypothalamus that receives inputs from all over the brain. Hormone number one goes up. That's a neural hormone synthesized in the nerve, released into these low, those little capillaries in the median eminence, carried through the portal vein, right there, to the anterior pituitary, where it stimulates hormone number two. And in the process, the signal is amplified. So a few molecules of hypothalamic hormone generate thousands of molecules of pituitary hormone. Then the pituitary hormones released into the blood and it goes drains back to the heart and is pumped all around the body. And that stimulates yet a third endocrine tissue to release a third hormone. So this is quite complex process. Hormone one, hormone two, hormone three. And there's amplification that happens at every step. So by the time you get down here, you have many, many more moles of hormone than you started out. And of course, this doesn't show negative feedback. This slide is complicated enough as it is. So what are all these hormones? Oh my goodness, there's so many. And my students, when they see this, they groan, but I'm gonna make it simple for you because we're only gonna talk about a few of these today. The anterior pituitary hormones have two functions. They stimulate the target glands, which are the gonads, the liver, the thyroid, the breasts, and the adrenal but they also induce these cells to grow. They have two functions, an acute function, hey, make me some cortisol, and then make my adrenal gland bigger, and that's more slow. So here is another Nobel Prize, the G-protein couple receptor. That is how ACTH, for example, stimulates the adrenal cortex to make cortisol. The names of these tell you what they do. This is not difficult. ACTH stands for adrenocorticotropic hormone. 
it stimulates the adrenal cortex. Prolactin, remember, it's easy to remember, that means promotes lactation. That's how it got its name. So prolactin stimulates the mammary glands to make milk in women who are nursing. Notice this is not an endocrine gland. This is an exocrine gland, but the concept is the same. Thyroid stimulating hormone from the pituitary stimulates the thyroid to make thyroid hormone. And as physicians, believe me, you're going to be spending a lot of your time thinking about the thyroid. It's got a lot of diseases associated with it and a lot of drugs that you give as a, res as a result. Growth hormone is by far the most complicated, and we're going to try to keep it simple. We're going to, going to ignore the metabolic effects of growth hormone for today and focus on the hormonal secretory effect. Now, many people don't know this, but growth hormone actually is not very potent itself as a growth factor. It has to stimulate the liver. Yes, the liver is an endocrine gland to make this very interesting hormone called IGF-1 or insulin-like growth factor one. It's a horrible name. It was named for its structure. And again, students get confused and say insulin-like, oh, it must have something to do with blood sugar. But for today, think of IGF-1 only as a growth factor. In fact, it used to be called, when I was a student, it was called somatomedin, which means mediates somatic growth. I have to say it was a much better name because it told you what its function is, not what its structure is, but that's okay. And then we have the gonadotropins, FSH and LH, and that's a whole other course. Reproduction is another course in many medical schools. And that stimulates the male or female gonads to both make gametes, the egg and the sperm, and to make hormones, testosterone and estradiol. Today, we're gonna focus on the thyroid, growth, and the adrenal cortex. So let's repeat what I just said. And you know, I've learned if anything writing a textbook is repetition is good pedagogy. So here are these short axons that release their hormones shown these little green dots here. Those are the hypothalamic neurohormones that drain through the portal into the anterior pituitary where they stimulate the anterior pituitary to make hormone number two, which I already described to you. So what are these hypothalamic hormones? And why am I wasting your time telling you about them? Because this one, this one, and this one, and this one are all the basis of drugs that you're going to use to treat patients. That's why I teach it. If that wasn't the case, I wouldn't bother you with it. So GNRH, gonadotropin-releasing hormone, stimulates the gonadotropins. Growth hormone releasing hormone stimulates growth hormone. These are the hypothalamic hormones. Now, here's a real oddball. I already told you that growth hormone's an odd hormone. Somatostatin, stat means stop, and somato means growth. So here we have a gas pedal in a car and a brake pedal in the car. You can get more growth hormone by taking your foot off the brake, somatostatin. Or you can get more growth hormone by pushing on the gas or a combination thereof. Thy uh, thyrotropin releasing hormone stimulates TSH, which stimulates the thyroid. Now, here's another oddball. Prolactin, the gas pedal is always on. Prolactin secretion is always maximal, and it needs to be told to stop. And that's done by this neurohormone dopamine. And I know you've heard of dopamine. This is not the same dopaminergic nerves that are elsewhere in the brain that are involved in depression and psychosis. These are a very specific bunch of dopaminergic nerves that only release their hormones into the portal blood vessels to inhibit prolactin release. So now we have to put it all together. We built this building block, and I'm not going to go through these again, but it's this three chain hormone one. Hormone two, hormone three. Hormone one, hormone two, hormone three, et cetera. And it, it's hard to learn at first, but the names tell you what they do. Thyrotropin releasing hormone stimulates thyrotropin, which stimulates the thyroid. And there you go. So now you thought that was complicated. Now we have to add feedback. All control systems in your body 
have some form of ne negative feedback. I like to call it thermostatic control. It's just like the thermostat in the room that you're sitting to keep the temperature fairly constant. So now we have our chain of hormones. Wonderful. We've been through that three times. But now the end product of these glands can inhibit their own release by negative feedback. And why do you need that? Well, you want to turn on cortisol, but you don't want it to stay on for hours and hours and hours. You want it to shut off once the stimulus is gone. So not only is the system built to turn itself on, but it's built to turn to shut itself off. And that's what negative inhibition means. So now, let's focus on what we're going to talk about today. We're going to start with the thyroid, then the adrenal, then the liver. So here's where you're thought, oh, another Nobel Prize. Kocher, way back in the early 1900s, got the Nobel Prize for the discovery of the function of the thyroid. And the thyroid gland is fascinating. You can all have one, unless it's been removed, obviously. And you can feel it. We teach our students how to do a thyroid exam. I'm sure you will learn how to do this. It's uh, very learnable. You can feel all the lumps and bumps on the thyroid. Um, and there are great videos on YouTube, by the way, if you ever want to see how a thyroid exam is done. And it's got two lobes and an isthmus, not that important for today. But if you cut the thyroid gland open, it's really interesting. It's not a solid gland the way other glands are. It's like these little tiny, I like call them tennis balls or peas, garbanzo beans, whatever you want to call them, very small follicles. And these are through three-dimensional, they're little balls. And if you imagine it's a tennis ball, but a really, really small one, the rubber part of the tennis ball are the cells that make the thyroid hormone. Inside the tennis ball is filled with this gel. It's kind of a goop, like two toothpaste, called colloid. And the colloid is where the thyroid hormone is stored. And there's a good reason for that. And I'm going to get onto that right now. So the control system, again, you could probably tell me what it is. TRH, TSH, thyroid hormone, negative feedback. It's the same theme over and over. Now, the thyroid hormones are very interesting because they contain iodine. Thyroxin T4 has four iodines. Triodothyronine T3 has three iodines. That's, how the, that's what the four and three represent. Now, the problem with iodine, sticking it on these modified tyrosines, it's a very toxic molecule. So if the thyroid gland synthesized the very toxic iodine ion called iodide inside the cell, it would kill the cell. So by secreting out into the colloid the iodine, you can make thyroid hormone and safely store it in the colloid. The other reason which we're going to talk about is that we didn't evolve with a lot of access to iodine. There are a lot of places where there's very little iodine in the diet. So when you find something with iodine, you want to eat a lot of it and store the iodine for what we call a rainy day. I don't have much iodine in my diet, but I've got a lot stored in my thyroid gland. So that's another reason. Now, what does thyroid hormone do? Well, it's a very complex hormone but it works by activating transcription and translation. And I know you've learned about genetics. Transcription is the formation of mRNA from DNA, and translation is the formation of protein from mRNA. And what thyroid hormone does, it's a very widely active, it affects every cell type in the body. But for today, it's very important in babies. And you'll learn in your education about neonatal hypothyroidism, a devastating disease. But we're going to focus on the adult now. And the main function of thyroid hormone is to turn up your furnace, turn up the heat, increase your metabolism, what's called a basic metabolic rate. And in order to do that, you know, when you light a fire, if you want the fire to get bigger, you got to put more wood on it. That's the glucose. And you got to give more oxygen to the fire. That's why you have a bellows. And that's exactly what happens in the cell. The mitochondria, the site of oxidative phosphorylation is turned on. You burn all kinds of fuel. 
you consume more oxygen. In fact, people with hyperthyroidism, if you touch their skin, their skin is hot because they're generating so much heat. Well, if you're going to do all of that, you've got to pump more oxygen and blood and glucose to the body. So it stimulates the cardiovascular system to maintain the flow of fuel and the removal of waste products, I might add, to the tissues. So now I had to focus on one endocrine disease and I did some reading about Indonesia and you have a very fascinating approach to this, which I'm gonna mention in a minute. So I'm gonna talk, my pathophysiology for today is called endemic goiter and it's due to an iodine deficiency. There are some areas of the world, like in Switzerland, for example, in the mountains of Switzerland, where there's no iodine in the diet, none. They must supplement their diet with iodine. In the United States, we have something called iodized salt. And we eat so much salt in the United States anyway, way more than we need, that nobody has iodine. I've never seen a patient in 40 years with iodine deficiency in the United States who didn't have some GI disease. So low iodine intake, you can't make the thyroid hormone. Because as I already told you, without iodine, it's not thyroid hormone. It's an amino acid called tyrosine. So what happens? Well, if you can't make thyroid hormone because you don't have enough iodine, the break is gone. And so the thyroid hormone goes up in attempt to wake up this thyroid gland that can't make thyroid hormone because there's no iodine. But the trophic effects of TSH makes the thyroid get bigger and bigger and bigger to humongous size. But without iodine, it doesn't help because it can't make thyroid hormone, doesn't matter how big the thyroid gets. So this is an example of an endemic goiter. There's some areas of the world that still have, I have a friend that did a trip to Egypt and got into a small village in Egypt and everybody, every single person in the village had an endemic goiter. She couldn't believe it. She's an endocrinologist too. So there you go. Look how huge this thyroid got. But she's still got hypothyroidism because she has no iodine. And without iodine, you can't make the thyroid hormone. So I looked up endemic goiter in Indonesia. And it's really interesting. First of all, you do have iodized salt. And central Java seemed to be an epicenter of endemic goiter. Because almost all the articles I found were about Bali, central Java. Really interesting. I got to learn a lot about your fascinating geography. And there was an article about oral health and endemic goiter. And then this one was the most interesting. This is a UN publication, United Nations publication, about how Indonesia took care of this problem in a very advanced way, where they just said, hey, we've got to do something about this. And they had this national effort to use iodized salt or other forms of iodine. And it was very successful, I might add. So it's a, you, your country has a long history with dealing with endemic goiter, particularly, apparently, and you would know better than me, Central Java and Bali. So I thought that was interesting, maybe personalize this a little bit. And you should read about your country's amazing response to this problem. Very, very uh, um, thorough and complete response. I was, I was really, it was really interesting to read these articles. So let's now move on to the... Adrenal gland, my favorite gland. So I didn't put it first because I didn't want to seem biased. So again, the same string, CRH from the hypothalamus, ACTH from the pituitary, cortisol from the adrenal gland. Why is it called an adrenal gland? Well, ad means next to. So there's two adrenal glands, each one next to your kidneys. And I know you all know where your kidneys are. So the adrenal sits right on top in, the, in, in humans of the kidney. That's why it's called adrenal, which means next to the kidney. And then of course we have our old friend negative feedback, which is part of all of these control systems. So we were talking earlier about the circadian rhythm of cortisol before the students came on. In a human with a diurnal lifestyle, that is you sleep at night and you're awake during the day, this is what your cortisol rhythm looks like. It starts to go up early in the morning and cortisol is a glucocorticoid. It's a steroid hormone that stimulates glucose production. 
And it's this increase in cortisol that keeps you from getting hypoglycemic while you sleep because you're not eating. So your liver makes glucose while you're sleeping under the influence of cortisol. It peaks around when you wake up and then it goes down, down, down during the day. And next day, the whole thing starts over again. This is every day of your life. It actually starts in very early infancy and doesn't stop until you're dead, basically. And yet another Nobel Prize was, was given for the discovery of cortisol. A very interesting, a wonderful book has been written about it. By. So what are the effects of cortisol? I have yet, I've been studying cortisol for almost 50 years. I have yet to find an organ or tissue that doesn't express the receptor for cortisol. If there is one, I've never found it. If the tissue's alive, eye, skin, the heart, every organ I've ever studied has a cortisol effects. And there's so many effects, it's almost impossible to talk about them all in one slide. But here are a few. It's a glucocorticoid. So it stimulates gluconeogenesis. And if you've ever had biochemistry, that word should be familiar to you. That means neo means new, genesis means make glucose. So that's the ability of the liver to make new glucose from other substrates. But it also releases glucose from its storage sites as glycogen, has many effects. Very strong cardiovascular effects of cortisol. People who lack cortisol, something called adrenal insufficiency, can die of shock because their blood pressure is so low without it. There are some unidentified protective effects to prevent, pr uh, protect you from the effects of stress. And by stress, I mean general stressors. Very hard to define, extremely hard to study. Well known as an anti-inflammatory and immune suppressor. So for example, people with asthma, rheumatoid arthritis, colitis, inflammatory bowel disease or often give synthetic forms of cortisol, the most common being prednisone, to decrease inflammation. Now they have a lot of side effects, but they work. Our transplant patients, I'm right across the street from our transplant clinic, they are almost all put on glucocorticoids to suppress the immune response so they don't reject the organ they've just been given. And interestingly enough, one of the important things about cortisol is to allow you to survive starvation. So when you're starving, and there are still populations in the world where starvation is a significant problem, cortisol also shuts down non-essential functions. Why would you go bother to reproduce if you have no food? And the same thing with growth. So a child who is mal has malnutrition does not grow very well because the increase in cortisol shuts off growth hormone. So now here's the disease we're gonna talk about, adrenal insufficiency. And we already talked about it a little bit before the students came. So here's the normal loop. We've talked about this ad nauseum now. CRH from the hypothalamus stimulates ACTH, which stimulates cortisol, negative feedback. There's two kinds of adrenal insufficiency. The adrenal gland is destroyed. That's what that X means. Because of that, there's no cortisol. And if there's no cortisol, ACTH goes up because you've lost the break. There's no negative feedback. And that's how we make the diagnosis. Cortisol is low, ACTH is high, simple. Treat the patient, put them on glucocorticoid. Uh, how you do that is not important for today. To replace the missing cortisol, you also have to replace one other missing hormone, aldosterone, which is done with something called fundracortisone, but that's not what we're talking about. But there's another form of adrenal insufficiency that's actually more common, and that's if the pituitary is not working right. Well. Because if there's not enough ACTH, there won't be enough cortisol. And that leads to atrophy of the adrenal. That's what this little tiny box means, because you need the trophic growth-promoting effects of ACTH. So diagnostically, these differences are, are important because you're going to treat them differently. You have to look at the pituitary versus the adrenal as the primary site of pathology. And now finally, our friend growth hormone. 
probably one of the most misunderstood and abused hormones in the world. And you've probably all read about these Olympic athletes and other athletes that use growth hormone to build muscle mass and lose fat mass. That's not what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna talk about the hormonal effects of growth hormone to stimulate insulin-like growth factor or somatamine from the liver. So the liver, you don't normally think of as an endocrine gland, which it is, it produces hormone number three in the growth hormone sequence, IGF-1. So how does that make kids grow? Well, it does two things. It makes their bones grow. And you all know about how children grow so fast, incredibly fast, particularly at puberty. But you also want their organs to grow. So you probably all know who Shaquille O'Neal is, right? The basketball player in the United States who's seven feet tall, weighs about 300 pounds. Well, his heart better be bigger than my heart or one of us is in trouble. And so all the organs grow and that is draw, driven by the same hormone. So a tall person will have a larger heart. A short person will have a smaller heart. Makes perfect sense. If I had Shaquille O'Neal's heart in my chest, I wouldn't have room for my lungs. If he had my heart in his chest, he wouldn't be able to get out of bed in the morning because there wouldn't be enough blood flow. Same thing with the lungs, the pancreas, the guts, everything. So this coordinates the organ growth with linear growth. And here's what growth hormone looks like during the day. Now, my grandma, a wonderful person, my grandmother, always would be kicking us out of the house, saying, go run around in the sun. And then when we come back, she put us to bed. Because she knew from her vast experience as a non-educated person that exercise is good for children and sleep is good for children because it's under those two circumstances that children have their biggest burst of growth hormone. And children that don't get enough exercise and children that don't get enough sleep typically don't grow as well as they would have otherwise. It makes perfect sense. So what's the sequence here? Oh boy, growth hormone, I already told you, is a little more complicated. The hypothalamic hormones are either stimulatory, the gas pedal, or inhibitory, the brake pedal. And some combination of these two things, hitting the pituitary, leads to an increase in growth hormone. Either it's an increase in hypothalamic GHRH, or it's a decrease in somatostat, or both. That stimulates IGF-1, and IGF-1 makes kids grow. But wowie zowie, is it complicated? And I'm gonna, the details of this are not important. So when I teach this to my students, because I do test them on this, because clinically this is extremely important. I say, look at the left side and then look at the right side. The left side's easy. It's just like what you've already learned. GHRH stimulates growth hormone. Growth hormone stimulates insulin-like growth factor that makes you grow. And there's negative feedback. Why couldn't it just be that simple? Wouldn't that be wonderful? But it isn't because the hypothalamic hormone somatostatin inhibits growth hormone. Well, now is where I lose my students. If you want negative feedback, you want to stimulate the, the brake pedal. And that's exactly what happens. So in a negative feedback loop, and this is an engineering principle, you just need a negative sign. We don't really care where it is. So in this case, the negative sign is this inhibitory hormone so that negative feedback, quote unquote, is IGF-1 stimulating SST, which then inhibits growth hormone. Now, is that not complicated enough for you? But the reason we teach it is there is a drug that you will be prescribing, or at least learning about, called somatostatin analog or octreotide, that's used to treat people with growth hormone secreting tumor. So the reason why I teach this material when I, the way I teach it is because every single one of these loops has drugs that you're going to have to learn and diseases that you're going to have to learn. If you don't understand the basic principle, you'll never understand why you're going to use the drug or how to make the diagnosis. So what does growth look like in a, in a, a newborn to adulthood? 
Well, early on, the first year of life, and those of you go into pediatrics, you're going to be looking at this every day in your patients, doing, doing height charts on them, something that's free. You can do it. It doesn't cost anything. Every time you see the kid, you put the age and the height, and you plot it, and you keep that in the medical record over time. And you can look at it and say, is this kid growing normally or not? Very straightforward, very simple. I did it on my son just for fun. Uh, to, to plot his growth, even though it was completely normal. Okay, so early in growth, it's independent of growth hormone. It just happens. You're born, you grow. You don't really need much to grow. But then around one to two years of age, you need growth hormone. So kids without adequate growth hormone typically grow normally in the first year of life. And then all of a sudden they stop growing because that's when they need growth hormone. And that's when you have to start treating them with growth hormone to make them grow. Then something interesting happens at puberty. Everybody has a growth spurt at puberty. Why? Because the gonadal steroids, testosterone in men or estrogen in women, stimulate growth hormone secretion. So I remember my son when he was about 14 years old, you could almost hear him growing when he laid in bed. And I used to tell my family, don't put your hands too close to his face because he'll probably eat it. He was eating so many calories just to support the growth. It's dramatic. And any of you who have had children or remember your childhood, remember how much calories you took in during your growth spurt just to support the growth in excess of what you need to live. Something my brother, I remember, used to come home from school and eat a pound of meatloaf. Like, what? A pound of meatloaf? I was only 10 at the time. How can one person eat a pound of meatloaf? Well, he was growing, that's why. And it happens in girls and boys. What's interesting is, as you all know, girls go through puberty a little bit before boys. And that's one of the reasons why boys grow up to be taller than girls, because they, they, they have a little bit more time to grow before the growth spurts. They have a head start. So why do we stop growing? Why don't we just keep growing till we die? Well, the reason is that the gonadal steroids also stop growth by shutting off the growth plates in your bones, the epiphyseal plates. So gonadal steroids, testosterone in males, estrogen in females, stimulates the growth spurt by stimulating the growth hormone, but stops the growth spurt because the bones can't grow anymore. So if I am now, you know, in my 30s, if you gave me growth hormone, I wouldn't get any taller, unfortunately. But other things will happen, as you will see. So growth hormone deficiency is something that every physician has to learn how to diagnose. Now, these two children were projected to be the same height. And we have very complicated formulas to do that from mid-parental height. But this little girl was clearly not growing. Up until a year of age, they were the same height, projected to be the same adult height. But then she stopped growing. And she was growth hormone deficient. And when she was put on it, unfortunately, her diagnosis was made a little late because she's already three years old. She should have been started on growth hormone earlier. But when you still have time to start on growth hormone, she grew, grew to a normal height. But the more fascinating disease is acromegaly. And acromegaly means big acro joints. Acro joints are your hands and feet. So I've already given it away. And what acromegaly is due to, interestingly, is a small, typically, growth hormone-secreting tumor in the pituitary. It arose from normal growth hormone-secreting cells, but something happened to it. It went crazy so that it produces too much growth hormone and is insensitive to negative feedback. So growth hormone goes up, 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 up. IGF-1 is through the roof. That's how we make a diagnosis, by the way, by measuring IGF-1. And you get this huge increase in growth. Now, I'm sure you've seen photographs like this, but it's always fun to show it. So obviously, you can tell which person has acromegaly here. You don't have to be a medical student to do that. This young man is what's called an acromegaloid giant. And what do we mean by that? He's got the coarse features of acromegaly, which I'll explain in a minute but he's obviously outrageously tall because he had this growth hormone secreting tumor before puberty. 
Because if he had gotten it after puberty, like this man, he would have gotten these coarse features because the skin, the facial cartilage, the hands, the feet can still grow, but the bones have stopped growing. So you don't get taller, but you get these what are called acromegaloid features or coarse features, somebody calls. So as a diagnostician, you can always tell, did they have the tumor before puberty or during puberty, or did it come after puberty? Are they taller than they should be? Basically, it's very simple. This is my favorite. These are monozygotic twins, identical twins. Well, tell me which one has acromegaloid. Pretty obvious, right? This young man, this is his identical twin. They have the same genes. But the acromegaloid giant, first of all, has coarse features because his face, his jaw is still growing, his nose is still growing. They get enormous tongues because the tongue, and in fact, sometimes the tongue's so big they can't close their mouth. His hands and feet are bigger. That's why it's called acromegaly. These are the acral joints because there's still cartilage in your feet and hands and your face that can grow. Now, how about popular culture? Now, I don't know <laughs> what you know in Indonesia, but I suspect you've seen one of these. This is Andre the Giant, who was a professional wrestler, who was in the movie The Princess Bride, one of my favorite movies, who was from France. He's an acromegaloid giant and was famous for being able to drink a case of wine in one sitting. Which, I don't know why I know that, but I do. So, and that's the Hulk Hogan, you know, the, these ridiculous professional wrestlers. So he was 7'4", weighed 500 pounds, well, and has these coarse features. This is a TV show in the United States, an absolutely idiotic show called The Adams Family. And this is Lurch, who was the butler who had acromegaly. And of course, this is the James Bond hero, Jaws who had acromegaly. I actually met him. He came to the endocrine meetings one time to support the Growth Hormone Foundation because they were trying to raise money. And of course, all three of these men had had growth hormone secreting pituitary tumors. So how would you treat this person if you made the diagnosis early enough? Obviously, they, their diagnosis was made very late in their symptoms. Well, first thing you do, I'm gonna go up a slide, is call a surgeon, a neurosurgeon. Get that tumor out of there. But sometimes they can't get the whole tumor. So what else could you do? You could give something that inhibits growth hormone secretion, somatostatin. So that's where you have the somatostatin now. Okay. So I'm actually finishing with a few minutes to spare, as I promised. And again, I apologize if I spoke quickly too quickly. I'm from New York. You know, we, we talk fast and with our hands. So what I always tell my students at the end of every session is think feedback. When you're a physician and you see somebody with a low thyroid hormone, think, what, what is the feedback doing? Will TSH be increased or will it be decreased? And if you do that systematically, the best physiologist that I work with other than me, of course, that was a joke, everybody, are the clinical endocrinologists because they use this material every day of their life. They're always thinking about normal physiology because if you don't understand the normal, you're never going to understand the abnormal. So think feedback. What will happen to pituitary hormone secretion if the target gland it stimulates has decreased in function? That's what the questions that I assigned or wrote that you guys are going to do right now is going to address this. What will happen to the pituitary hormone secretion and target gland secretion if you give a really high dose of a drug that acts just like the hormone that it produces? So for example, thyroid hormone. What if you gave somebody massive doses of thyroid hormone? What would happen to their pituitary hormone TSH secretion? And what would happen to the thyroid gland, would it get bigger or smaller? So again, the, that's the end of the first part of this. I purposefully kept it short because I like to have conversations. So uh, we're going to have lots of conversation. Um, I am truly honored that you asked me. It was really fun putting this together. I've 
never done a talk like this before. I've given things on the thyroid, things on the adrenal, things on growth hormone, but never all at once. And I had a blast doing it. The most fun I had though was reading about Indonesia, um, which I have to admit ahead of time, I knew a little bit about, but nothing that does it justice for the really interesting, it's fascinating place. Um, I read a lot about thyroid uh, goiter, endemic goiter in Indonesia and your government's a, a approach to it, which was really impressive. Um, there's no way the United States could pull something like that off, not a chance. We can't even agree on, you know, that's trivial things. That's something that important. Um, so that's it for my presentation. Now I think we're supposed to go on to the next part of this, the question and answer. So I will stop sharing, correct? I'm going to stop sharing. And there we go. Thank you very much uh, for your fascinating lecture, Prof. Uh, we learned a lot directly from you. And now we will proceed to our second session. Uh, the questions and answers for the invited students from uh, four universities. Uh, I will explain shortly about the procedures. Uh, so for the uh, each invited university uh, with their appointed students, they will receive each, uh, each set of questions. And appointed students will have to answer the questions according to the provided time. So each university has eight minutes. Uh, at limit to answer the question. And after students finish with their answers, uh, so Professor Raf will directly give clarification and feedback for uh, each set. And after that, we will proceed with the next set of questions for other universities. And for students, don't forget that there will be an award for the best student who answered the questions. And the announcement will be given uh, through your email. Without uh, further ado, for the first uh, key A session, the question and answer session, I will give the session to Ms. Sri Sumartiningsi, SSI MCUS, PhD from the Sports Science Faculty of Universitas Negeri Semarang. Ms. Sri, uh, the time is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Emilda. Uh, good morning, Prof. Hausel, Prof for an excellent presentation. And good morning all for the EIV member. I would like to uh, give the, the question and answer the question one, what will happen to plasma glucose if the insulin secreting cells are destroyed? Uh, we'll answer with Angrani Dewi. This uh, student from sports science faculty that's still semester one. Angraini, uh, you can answer directly. Thank you, Miss. Before, <clears throat> uh, let me introduce myself first. My name is Angraini Kaputri. Uh, I'm 19 years old. I'm majoring sports science from Universitas Negeri Semarang. I'm here to answer about the question of number one. What will happen to plasma glucose if the insulin secreting cells are destroyed? Uh, this condition is caused when the beta cells that make insulin have been destroyed by antibodies. These are usually substances released by the body to fight against uh, infection. Hence, they are unable to produce insulin. With too little insulin, the body can no longer move glucose from the blood into the cells, causing high blood glucose levels. Uh, if the glucose level is high enough, excess glucose spills into the urine. This drugs extra water into the urine, causing more frequent urination and thirst. <clears throat> this leads to dehydration, which can cause confusion. In addition, with too little insulin, the cells cannot take uh, in glucose for energy and other sources of energy, such as fat and muscle, are needed to provide this energy. Uh, this makes the body tired and can uh, cause weight loss. Uh, and this, uh, if this continues, patients will can become very ill. Uh, I think that's enough from me. Thank you.
Should I comment now or wait till the end of the? Yeah, I think you can directly comment. Or... Oh, that was excellent. You are absolutely right. It's called type one diabetes mellitus. It used to be called juvenile diabetes, but we don't call it that anymore. Uh -huh. um, and the one other major thing that happens, particularly in children, is something called diabetic ketoacidosis, which you alluded to because when you're making, breaking down a lot of fat, you make ketones, and then the liver converts them to acid. And so these people, these kids can get very low blood pH levels, which can kill them. So in addition to the dehydration that you talked about and the catabolism, the weight loss, they can have this horrible thing called DKA, um, which is a medical emergency. And in your, I, I assume that you will be all rotating through emergency rooms. You will see children being brought in, typically by their parents, within DKA. And you will have to know exactly what to do because sometimes you only have minutes to, to, to jump in and save these kids. That was an outstanding answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. And now uh, number second, the question about what will happen to plasma glucose and plasma insulin concentration. Insulin target cells are resistant to the action of insulin. And the answer will be with the force. The force, could you open your mic? Yes, thank you. Um, so, Good morning, everyone. I will answer the question. My name, first, let me introduce myself. My name is Ripos Juanti Kualu. I'm from Sports Faculty of UNES. And my answer is, for the second question is, what will happen to plasma glucose and plasma insulin concentration if insulin target cells are resistant to action of insulin? So the answer is, what will happen is, a lot of blood sugars will enter the bloodstreams the pancreas will pump out more insulin to get blood sugars into cells. Over time, cells stop responding to all that insulin. They're becoming insulin resistant. The pancreas keeps making more insulin, try to make cells respond. Eventually, the pancreas can't keep up and blood sugars keeps rising. This is called insulin resistance. As a result, blood sugar does not get into these cells to be stored for energy when sugar cannot enter cells, a high level of sugar will build up in a blood. This will, this is called hyperglycemia. The body is unable to use the glucose for energy. So that's the answer. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah, I, I, you're ab absolutely right. This is, I, I don't, is somebody going to answer question three? It was an extra credit question. Yeah, yeah. Not, I'm gonna... yeah number two, you will be answered with uh, okay. Rahmat Satyanko. I, then I have nothing to add. Uh, the one difference between one and two yes. is that one happens very fast. Mm -hmm. These kids will get a viral infection and within a week, they'll be in the hospital. Question two, that insulin resistance takes years, sometimes 10, 20 years before the diagnosis is made. So they're really quite different, as you pointed out. One is the lack of insulin, one is the resistance to insulin. Excellent job, both of you. Thank you very much, Prof. Harsel. And then number three, please, uh, Rahmat. Uh, what is what this is is represented by question one and question two. Rahmat, please answer. Yes. Thanks. Let me introduce myself. My name is Rahmat Sabianto from the Department of Sport Science. Yes. Here I will answer number three. Mm. Yes. Okay. The this is that this represents by question one is diabetes type one. The this is that represents by question two is diabetes type two. That is correct. And, and the reason why I asked this question is the terminology point. The modern name for the lack of insulin is type one diabetes mellitus, as you said very accurately. 
and two is type two diabetes and mellitus. But in older books, you will see terms like juvenile and adult onset diabetes, or even worse than that, insulin dependent and non-insulin dependent diabetes. Those terms are no longer accepted because one, adults can get type one, children can get type two. And I can say very sadly in the United States because of our obesity crisis, the incidence of type two diabetes, because it's very much tied to the acquisition of body fat in adolescence is growing, sorry for the pun, dramatically. It's very disturbing. We don't call one insulin dependent anymore, even though they are insulin dependent, because we use insulin to treat type two, just a lot of it to try to overcome the insulin resistance. And so the proper terminology now, and it could change in your careers, is type one for burning out the islet cell and type two for the resistance to insulin. All three of you, excellent job, thank you. Thank you, Professor Hasselraff. And we hope that you can be invited guest lecture in sports and faculty and you got greeting from our Dean, Professor Tandio Rahayu. Welcome to sports science faculty, Universitas Negeri Semarang. Thank you very much for the chance at this time. Thank you. Now I'm going back to um, Dr. Dr. Emma, uh, back to the moderator. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Ri, uh, for that, guiding <laughs> the uh, wonderful discussion. And we will uh, go to the next uh, question and answer set for uh, the next universities. The second session I will give to uh, Dr. Ratika Febriani M. Biomed from Faculty of Medicine, Universitas Muhammadiyah Palembang. Uh, and the set of questions are already seen uh, on the screen. Dr. Ratika, please, the session is yours. Okay, thank you, Dr. Imelda. Good evening, Prof. Herschel, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity given to the University of Muhammadiyah Palembang. Um, okay, so for all the participants, especially the voice, from the song, University of Muhammadiyah Palembang, you can see the question on the screen and read it first, and then I will invite you to answer the question one by one. And let's start for the question number one. I would like to invite Maulidia to answer the question. Please, Maulidia, Tasha, the time okay. is yours. Okay, thank you, Doctor, for the opportunity. The Honorable Professor Hasrab as our speaker, the Honorable all the lecturer and doctor, and the Honorable all the participant. Before I answer this question, let me introduce myself. My name is Maulidia Tasya Salsabila. I'm a student from Faculty of Medicine, University Muhammadiyah Palembang, Batch 2018. In here, I would like to answer question number one. So the question is, what will happen to the RN secretion if a patient is put on a very high dose of thyroxine? So, before we answer this question, we have to know the physiology of thyroxine hormone production. And as you can see, guys, on the screen in front of you, there is a schema that tells about the physiology of thyroxine hormone production. And physiologically, there is a hormone called TRH, or thyrotropin releasing hormone. It was a hormone that produced by hypothalamus, which functions to stimulate TSH, or thyroid stimulating hormone, in anterior pituitary. Furthermore, thyroid stimulating hormone will be stimulate thyroid follicular cell to produce hormone T3 or T-iodotyronine as much as 20% and hormone T4 or tyroxine as much as 80%. When hormone thyroxine or T4 enter the circulation, it will be converted to hormone T3 or 3-iodotyronine through the deionization process. And then we have to know the amount of the hormone T3 or 3-iodotyronine is the main regulator for the secretion of hormone TRH and TSH hormone. Now, we can answer the question. When the patient is given a very high dose of thyroxine that will be a compensation from our body, it's called 
negative feedback respon. So, negative feedback respon will be decrease the secretion of PRH or pyrotropin releasing hormone in hypothalamus and thyroid stimulating hormone in anterior pituitary. So, what will happen to PRH secretion if a patient is put on very high doses, the PRH secretion will be decrease. Okay, that's all doctor. Thank you for the opportunity and I would like to say thank you uh, for Professor Rapto for uh, already give us a very, very great and phenomenal materi. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Wonderful, very uh, thorough answer. And I might add, this was not part of the question, that the way we monitor patients on thyroxin is by measuring TSH. So every year, a patient who is on thyroxin because they have hypothyroidism, we measure a TSH. If it's a little low, we cut back on the thyroid, T4. If it's a little high, we up it a little bit. And it's very accurate. So the body, the negative feedback system is telling you, the clinician, how much thyroid hormone they're on. And that's one of the reasons why this is so important. TSH is one of the most common measurements we do in the United States in the general medical clinic because the symptoms of hypothyroidism are so common that we use TSH to monitor patients. So excellent job. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor, for the review. And for the, uh, for the next question, I would like to invite Muhammad Ismail Shah to answer the question. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, good morning from Indonesia. I'm Ismail from Universitas Muhammadiyah Palembang. And thank you so much for the opportunity. And uh, it is such an honor to me to answering a question in front of Professor Herzlerath and all these great teachers. Okay, so my answer for this question is, in patient given a very high dose of thyroxine, then what will occur in the thyroid gland is no enlargement because the therapy of giving thyroxine is to provide T4 only formulation that will later to be converted in the body into T3 and does not have a significant impact on the follicular cells of the thyroid gland because the work of the therapy is not in the thyroid gland directly. In overdose thyroxine also causes the production of TSH and TRH to be very low due to negative feedback from the thyroid gland, but does not cause hyperplasia of the pituitary or hypothalamus. Hope my answer answering the question. Thank you so much. Thank you. So that's, I think I understood. Um, and I apologize if I didn't. So if you put somebody on a mega dose of thyroid hormone, their thyroid gland shrinks to the point where you can't even find it. And we had a patient many years ago because of negative feedback. The brain says, well, if you're going to take thyroid hormone, why should I bother to make it? That's a waste of my time. We had a patient come into our RER -R -E -R with tachycardia, that's a fast heart rate, the jitters, for lack of a better term, and all the symptoms of hyperthyroidism, but we couldn't find her thyroid. She had no thyroid. So we knew immediately that she was taking too much thyroid hormone. And we had to ask her, and it turns out this is kind of crazy diet doctor who's now been put out of business in another city who was giving her thyroid hormone to help her lose weight. And she was taking too much of it. So she was the symptomatically hyperthyroid, but she had no thyroid gland because of negative feedback. So that's the easy way to remember that. Um, so good job. Thank you, Professor, for giving you the answer. For the last question, I would like to invite Fadila Yasmin. Thanks, Fadila. Thank you, Doctor. First of all, good morning, Indonesia, for Prof. Herschel and everyone in this meeting. First of all, I want to say thank you to, uh, to Prof. Herschel for the presentation and explanation about endocrinology and thank you to Rotratika for giving me this opportunity. My name is Fadila Jasmine Shahab from Muhammadiyah Palembang University, and I will answer the third question. So we can inhibit the thyroid gland to produce T4. There are three ways that we can do. The first is pharmacological treatment. The second is radioiodine. And the, uh, third, the third is surgery. First, for pharmacology, the drugs used are antithyroid drugs from thiourea derivates, namely cabimazole and propyl thioracil. The drugs uh, act to reduce thyroid uh, hormone secretion by differing oxidized iodide from the influence of the enzyme thyroid peroxidase, which is involved in the production and incorporation of iron tyrosine in the thyroid gland. Uh, and then for the dose for carbimazole is 20 to uh, 60 milligrams per day, 
per day and the dose for PTU is 300 until 600 milligram per day. And the second treatment we can do radio iodine treatment is given in the form of sodium iodine solution. Radioactive iodine works by accumulating in thyroid tissue and selectively destroying overactive thyroid tissue through local radiation for one to six months. And the last treatment is then uh, surgery or thyroidectomy. We do it if the other uh, treatment doesn't help. Uh, and I think that's my answer. Thank you. Outstanding. You are absolutely right. And what's so interesting about this is how it's changed, at least in the United States, over time. When I was a student, everybody got radioactive iron. That's what was done. Uh, people didn't, you know, were scared of it a little bit maybe, but it works extremely well. Then people started saying, well, why are we giving, maybe it has off-target effects. There was some thought that maybe it made the eye disease worse or it made this worse. So then people started using the, th the thionamides, methimazole and PTU. We use mostly methimazole now. The only time we use PTU is generally in pregnant women uh, because methimazole hasn't been really studied well. And that, as you said, blocks organification of iodine. And now there are a lot of doctors that just put the patient on the low doses of methimazole and just keep their fingers crossed. And the most recent thing is that thyroid surgery usually was only re reserved for the most, oh, you got to get that thyroid out of this person's going to croak, basically. That strider, you know, the thyroid was pressing on the trachea or something. Well, now we have thyroid surgeons where the first treatment they do is thyroidectomy because the technique has gotten so good that they can whip the thyroid out really quick with no side effects and it's permanent. They don't have to take medicine. You don't have to worry about the radioactivity. So this keeps going around in circles. You know, when, Co when, when the Nobel Prize was given back in the 1903, all they did was thyroidectomy. And now we're coming all the way back <laughs> to thyroidectomy. It's kind of interesting. As medicine advances, you know, new drugs come out, new surgical techniques, and uh, things change. But when I was a student, it was just 99% of the people got radioactive iodine. Right. So beautiful job of summarizing that. Um, very important because it's pharmacology, it's surgery, it's medicine, it's physiology, it's got it all. Um, that's the thing I love about endocrinology. Anyway, great job. Yeah, if I'm talking too long, stop. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor, for the extra review and your explanation. And then I will return it to the moderator, Dr. Imelda. Yes, thank you, Dr. Atika, for guiding such a great discussion. And now, uh, please, Miss um, Aulia, can you, uh, if the next, yeah the next uh, question and answer set for the next university. Thank you for students from uh, Universitas Muhammadiyah Palembang for answering the questions. And the third session will be given to Dr. Nisa Karima, Master of Science from Faculty of Medicine, Universitas Lampung. Dr. Nisa, the session is yours. Thank you, moderator. Thank you for this opportunity and good evening. Prof. Herschel, and thank you for the enlightening lecture before. So in this question set three, uh, my student from Universitas Lampung will have uh, read this question for 30, 30 minutes, 30 seconds. And the first question will be answered by Dafa Fahriza. Uh, I'm sure this uh, Dafa here uh, for the question and you can answer Location number one. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning. Good morning from Indonesia. I'm honored and delighted to be able to answer this question. Thank you, moderator, for this opportunity and time. I would also say thank you very much, Prof. Herschel, for your outstanding presentation. And thank you very much, EIUV, Ikatan Ahli Yilmu Fahal Indonesia. And thank you, Dr. Ermita. Okay, before I begin, let me introduce myself. I am Dafa Fahreza as a preclinical medical student of University of Lampung. Okay, so without further ado, let me answer this question. 
Chronic glucocorticoids represents a widely therapy for several diseases in consideration of both anti-inflammatory and immunosuppressive activity. But if it's used at high doses for prolonged period, it can determine the systemic effects characteristic of Cushing syndrome. In addition to signs and symptoms of hypercorticolism. Patients on chronic GC therapy are at risk to develop tertiary adrenal insufficiency after the reduction or the withdrawal of corticosteroids or during acute stress. This effect is mediated by the negative feedback loop on the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis, aka HPA axis, which mainly involves corticotropin releasing hormone, which represents the most important driver of adrenal corticotropic hormone release. Well, I'm gonna give some examples. Prednisone, which is the one of the synthetic glucocorticoid is the most prevalent prescribed drug. I mean, um, people give it, in, give it without any thinking much about cortisol, and it has a lot of side effects. One of them, of course, is the suppressed CRH because it's, it acts like cortisol, but even more so. And obviously, the CRH secretion will be lower, and then because of that, ACTH will be suppressed, whereas cortisol level will be low and the adrenal gland will be shrinked. Well, maybe that's it. Thank you. Thanks. You, you answered all three questions. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's great. <laughs> that was excellent. I have nothing to add. That was right on the money. Okay, well done. Great job, Dafa. But we still have a uh, uh, two questions left. Uh, there's two questions. Question two will, uh, uh, you can, you can answer the question. Okay, thank you, Doc. Uh, before that, let me introduce myself. My name is Muhammad Ars Kamal Fadil, and good morning, Professor, and to all the participants. I want to answer question number two. As we know that cortisol is a natural glucocorticoid that has a physiological effects, including the regulation of metabolism, uh, cardiovascular function, and growth, even immunity. And the rate of secretion follows a circadian rhythm that regulated by adrenocorticotropic hormone, and it rises up in the morning. In the plasma, cortisol is bound to corticosteroid binding globulin and albumin. In normal adults with the absence of stress, 10 until 20 mg of cortisol are secreted daily. High dose prednisone range from 40 to 60 mg per day. And the use of prednisone, especially at high doses, will induce higher cortisol levels. It acts like uh, cortisol and the GRF secretion or corticotropin releasing hormone secretion will be lower. And then there is a decrease in cortisol levels after the use of prednisone because it will suppress the HPA axis through negative feedback on the hypothalamus and pituitary. The occurrence of suppression of the hypothalamus and pituitary results in inhibited secretion of adrenocorticotropic hormone and can result in atrophy of the pituitary gland and adrenal gland. Adrenocorticotropic hormone deficiency causes the adrenal glands to be unable to produce enough cortisol. Okay, maybe this is my answer for question number two. Thank you, Doc. Outstanding. That, uh, I have nothing to add. It uh, very commonly causes adrenal atrophy, as you said. Perfect. I have no no uh, comment other than to say very good. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Prof. Uh, and this is a trick question. will be answered by Alka. Well, good morning. Thank you so much. I'm truly honored for this opportunity. And thank you so much for from great presentation and topic today. Well, let me introduce myself. My name is Ahmad al Kautsar, and I'm from Medical Faculty of Lampung University. For the question number three, in my opinion, absolutely no. Why? Because the adrenal glands made a steroid called cortisol that's similar to prednisone. Cortisol secretion from the adrenal cortex is regulated by a negative feedback system involving the hypothalamus and anterior pituitary. In the absence of an adequate amount of uh, adenocorticotropic uh, hormone, HCTH, the cortex will shrink and cortisol uh, secretion will decrease. 
the increase in exogenous steroids, in example, high dose of prednisone in prolonged time, acts in negative feedback to suppress the HPA axis that carries out normal cortisol secretion and maintain the integrity of the adrenal cortex. Prolonged suppression of HPA axis can lead to irreversible atrophy of the cortisol producing cell of the adrenal gland so that body may be permanently incapable of the cortisol uh, uh, producing its own cortisol amine. The adrenal gland is shown there will a uh, liter cortisol, which is adrenal uh, crisis, we call. Then, patient with prolonged exposure prednisone will experience suppress, uh, uh, suppression of HPA axis. This occurs through decreased synthesis and secretion of corticotropin uh, releasing hormone, CRH, in hypothalamus, as well as inhibition of releasing ACTH from the anterior pituitary. Decrease HGPH level causes the decrease in HGPH at the melanocortin 2 receptor, thereby reducing CAMP, which leads to decrease in cortisol secretion. Well, so when the patient takes the prednisone for a long time, the adrenal glands make way less cortisol. If patients stop prednisone or taper too quickly, the body won't have enough time to cortisol that it needs and a sudden withdrawal of the prednisone will result in symptoms similar to adrenal uh, insufficiency since the adrenal glands will not have time to produce hormones cortisol to meet the body requirement. So uh, for me, to withdraw prednisone in a person uh, who is taking for a year, the prednisone should be gradually reduced to physiological dose, should lower dose uh, very, very slowly. The patient should taper off prednisone, so adrenal glands have time to catch up and make normal levels of cortisol. I think that's all, Prof. Thank you so much. That was outstanding. You are absolutely right. The It's called glucocorticoid-induced secondary adrenal deficiency, and it's very common. And we still see patients who are not taught properly how to wean, the term we use is wean, off prednisone properly, and they get in all kinds of trouble. The largest, I don't know if you have medical malpractice in Indonesia, but the largest medical malpractice lawsuit in the history of my state was a woman who was, her family claimed, never instructed, had a wean off of prednisone. She stopped it and basically had a massive hypotensive stroke um, and became what we call a vegetable, you know, she was on a breathing machine and eventually died. It was a huge lawsuit. Now, the physician claimed that he had instructed her, but it never documented it in the chart. And when my colleague was asked to testify, he just told the lawyers, you better, the insurance company, you better just settle this because there's no way you're going to win. And we still see this. And the weaning of pre from prednisone is an art form. You can't, it's not for everybody. It has to be done properly. It has to be done slowly. You have to test the patient frequently because if you do it too fast, it won't be a good outcome. On the other hand, if you do it too slow, then they're on steroids for way too long. So, uh, and it has to be individualized. We had one patient took two years to wean off prednisone. There are some patients that you can never get off prednisone. The adrenal just never grows all the way back. So our rule of thumb is dose and time. If they're on a lower dose for a short period of time, no problem. If they're on a high dose for a long period of time, problem. And it's all because of the physiology. I, I guess I can't repeat that enough. If you understand the physiology, it makes perfect sense. All three of you, excellent, excellent job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Harshal, for your uh, confirmation and clarification. So this is the end of question set three. I will give back to the moderator. Thank you, Dr. Nisa, for guiding such an outstanding discussion from the students. And uh, now uh, we will go to the next uh, question and answer set for the next university. This is the last but not the least session, of course, uh, will be given to Dr. Dr. Ikhlas Muhammad Jenny, uh, Master of Medical Science uh, from the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences of uh, Muhammadiyah University, Yogyakarta. Dr. Ikhlas, the time is yours. Good morning, everybody. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Imelda, for the time given to us. Today, Alhamdulillah, I accompany the second year students to participate in this podcast lecture of physiology. Thank you to the committee for the chance given to us. Now it is the turn for our students to answer the questions set for provided by our distinguished lecturer, Professor Hesseraf. Question number one, what will happen to GHRH, secretion and uptide with severe liver failure and why? For this question number one, uh, I would invite our student Isma Fahadja Indrani to answer this question. Time is yours. Okay, uh, thank you. My name is Isma Fahadja Indrani. I'm a medical student from Universitas Muhammadiyah Yogyakarta, and I would like to answer the first question on what will happen to GHR8 secretion in a child with severe liver failure and why. So apparently, the hypothalamus controls the production of growth hormone or the GH by secreting hormone releasing hormone or GHRH, which stimulates the growth hormone secretion from anterior pituitary and somatostatin, which inhibits the growth hormone secretion. The growth hormone secretion is under feedback control, as is the secretion of other anterior pituitary hormones. The growth hormone acts on the hypothalamus to suppress the GHRH. The growth hormone also stimulates the liver to release the IGF-1 in the blood. On the other hand, the IGF-1 has a direct inhibitory effect on the, secre on the secretion of DGH from the pituitary. These growth factors will also stimulate the secretion of somatostatin and, inhib and inhibits the GHRH. The effects of IGF-1 in the cell targets are to increase protein synthesis that promotes growth. If a child has chronic liver failure, it will cause a low concentration of IGF-1 and also an excess of circulating GH. As a result, the child may suffer an abnormal growth velocity. The low concentration of IGF-1 fails to inhibit the GH or its secretion from hypothalamus. Therefore, in children with chronic liver disease, the plasma GH or it is in high concentration. Thank you. Thank you, Sisma. Oh, Very good. So GH goes up. Yeah, GHRH goes up because the lack of negative feedback. I think, yeah, so very good. So people don't think of the liver as an endocrine gland, but low IGF-1 is common in children with liver disease and they don't grow as a result because the growth hormone can't stimulate IGF-1 and IGF-1 is the main reason why you grow. So very good. Question two. Thank you, for, for the question two, I would invite our let, let, me just say, let me just say this question number two was the hardest question I asked. <laughs> so I'm just <laughs> letting you know ahead of time. For the question two, what would you give to this patient to maintain good velocity and why? Please, uh, our student, Mikhail Zia Ulhat, to answer this question. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. My name is Muhammad Mikhail Ziaul Haq, and I want to answer number two. Uh, ways to control the velocity of the child growth include, firstly, uh, improve liver function. The reason is by increasing liver function, liver cell function can normally again, so that insulin like growth factor one production also returns to normal. Secondly, hmm. uh, uh, given the combination human insulin like growth factor one, uh, there is is by giving the combination human insulin like growth factor one will act will affect target cell to stimulate growth because the effect of growth hormone on target cell growth is insulin like growth factor one so that the patient with liver failure thank you very much thank you what an outstanding answer you are absolutely right first you focus on the liver because the liver does a lot of other things in addition to making IGF-1. Like, <laughs> you know what you know what uh, cirrhosis and you know what icterus is, right? Yellow skin. And so, you know, if IGF-1 is low, there's something else that's going to be bad too. You can't live without a diseased liver. So first, treat the liver disease. And then you're right. You could give IGF-1. 
if it's available. It, sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. In fact, there was a massive study in the United States, kids with asthma who were given high doses of cortisol, which I already told you, you shut off growth hormone. And, but the problem is that cortisol also inhibits the liver response to growth hormone. So they tried to give IGF-1 to them to see if it would make them grow. Uh, it never caught on because it's too expensive. It's extremely expensive. I mean, growth hormone is mind-bogglingly expensive. $15,000 US dollars a year or more to treat a child with growth hormone. And IGF-1 is much, much more than that. It's much harder to make than growth hormone. So you are absolutely right. Focus on the liver because it's going to cause a lot of other problems and growth velocity. And if you can get your hands on some recombinant IGF-1, the kid will grow. Outstanding answer. That was a hard question. So outstanding. Thank you, Professor Hesseraf. And thank you for your terms for your answers. And now I will give back to the Dr. Imelja as a moderator. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ikhlas, for marvelous discussion from Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences of Muhammadiyah University, Yogyakarta. Thank you for students who answered the questions. And